Another week with Behind the Lens. February 2nd, another month. And Greg and I are here once again. And so we don't forget to let anybody know, if you want to check out Greg and his handiwork, you can find his reviews on DVDs, films, interviews, and all at... Oh, thank you. DeepestStream.com. Thank you. And if yeah. you're looking for me, you can find me at MovieSharkDeBlore.com. And she's a better writer, by the way. Just want to throw that out there. <laughs> way better writer. So if you want, go to MovieSharkDeBlore.com. And if you want secondary information, go to DeepestStream.com. So. <laughs> so between the two of us, we'll get you covered yes, on everything. Covered, covered. You know, yeah. and Greg has a lot of, you know, DVD stuff. John Wick comes out tomorrow. Tomorrow, yeah, I'm doing a giveaway. Uh, Tell us about it. Yeah. I'm giving out three Blu-rays, uh, and it ends uh, next Tuesday. So definitely check out my site. Thank you, Debbie, for the mention. And uh, yeah, so I love. But did you see John Wick? I love John Wick. Keanu love, is back. Yeah, you know, I never, I didn't see the last couple of movies, Forty Seven Ronin and The Man from Tai Chi. Is that the? I didn't see those two films, but John Wick, I think, was a return to form. Yeah. Yeah. No, John. So. I am. I was so thrilled when I saw John Wick in a screening. I paid money to go see it in the theater. Really. Okay. Mm -hmm. Do you pay money to see a lot of movies? I do. Can't I? Wait, you already see a lot of movies without paying. Why do you... Oh, maybe it's a purity of... Well, yeah, sometimes so. I like to get the audience feedback to see if my review is on the pulse of what moviegoers are actually... If, are they picking up some of the same things I'm picking up? Right. And what... Are they picking it up, or do you see... Many times, oh. yes. Sometimes, no. With the bigger blockbusters, yes, in, undisputably, oh. especially the family films. Um, as my dad once said, you know, I'll always be 11 years old. So, and that's true. That is, you'll always be 11 years old. I will you have a very youthful look at, <laughs> at cinema. Yeah. But, you know, with kid movies, yeah. family movies, because they are so important, and I think that we do have a shortage of them. Um, I'm very excited because this coming weekend I'll be doing uh, a, a home video press day for uh, Disney for Big Hero 6. Wow. And okay. also another Tinkerbell straight to DVD Blu-ray. Are they coverage on the lot? You're actually going to do interviews? Or? Mm -hmm. Oh, sweet. Awesome. I'm going to follow up with everybody I interviewed earlier. Mm -hmm. And so I, now I get to sit there and tell Don Hall, you know, I told you so. And Chris Williams, I told you so. Yes. So I'm, I'm very excited about that, and I can't wait to see all the extras. There are a lot of DVD extras oh, with, cool. with Big Hero 6. Awesome, and you're going to probably cover it next week as well. Um, there, there may be some mention, or I'll wait until, because it's coming out on home video, I think the 24th of February. Okay, gotcha. So we may wait and talk about it uh, on the 23rd. I love the films we're going to talk about today as well. Oh, yeah, so. today, is a, today is a big day. Number one, our sound engineer, Brian Leone, is very excited by our 1130 live call-in with Edward James Olmos. Um, he's back there, yeah, like, wooing and everything. <laughs> um, can you guys hear me through the glass when I do that? Yes, we I can. I was hoping you yes. guys could. Yes, we can. And your unbridled enthusiasm is always welcome. And yes. I, I know it will be... Um, this, it, He's narrating a very important documentary, Energizing Our World. It had its world premiere at Santa Barbara Film Festival last night. Oh. So we can find out how the premiere went. But uh, it's, it's an extremely powerful, important documentary about making the Earth sustainable. The power of one, actually. The power of one. That's a good way to describe yeah. it. Making, different, making a difference on an individual basis, but also seeing the big picture as well mm -hmm. and looking at with the sustainability acts uh, you know aspect yeah. so i'm anxious to talk to him we'll forget the fact that you know he is robert gonzalez and agents of shield we will we'll forget about that part battlestar galactica <sighs> admiral <Miami Vice>. admiral Adama. <laughs> yeah, yeah. you know now you're talking yeah. and of course the voice of diablo in beverly hills chihuahua I have not seen that movie because I'm not an 11 year old like you are. <laughs> so, which I I do regret. I would rather have the well, see. So you yeah. know, yeah. but and but we're gonna start off today. You and I both had a lot of fun last week with the Backstreet Boys. Okay, are you a fan of their music? I can honestly say I was not. You are. 
Uh, my fire. <laughs> was that Brian or Lydia? It's Brian. <laughs> uh, believe when I, I say I want it that I way. I want yes. it that way. <laughs> Tell me why. Ain't I can't. nothing but a. I can't so sing that either, but I can actually it. hold a tune. Yeah, I think Brian's the big fan. I, Brian is definitely <laughs> the big. I still have all my NSYNC and Backstreet Boys CDs. Oh my. Well, it's it's kind of like if you're an NSYNC fan, can you be a. A Backstreet Boy fan, like if you like the Yankees, can you like the Mets? I'm I'm sorry, Kinda. you know, if you liked yeah. David Cassidy, you could not like Donny Osmond, there and you vice go. versa. I just want to throw that out there. But Brian. if you liked David Cassidy, you could also like Bobby Sherman because he was a couple years earlier. Oh, and if you liked the Monkees, mm-hmm. you could like the Beatles. Right. So right. Good you point. Know, Good there point. are these, you know, lines that you draw with fandom. So you're doing it. You're doing correct, Brian. He's can, doing we, no, yeah, can, can we agree that it's 15 years later, though, so the fandoms it's, aren't as, it's, as vicious anymore? It's, now we're all, we're one, all one. it's 20 years later, 20 and years. let me tell you, when you see this documentary, which is the Backstreet Boys, show them what you're made of. Show them what you're made of. It celebrates their 20th anniversary. It also celebrates their return to touring and making an album after Kevin Richardson had left and took a few years and then came back. So, uh, 20 years later, looking at the concert footage, the fans are as rabid as ever. I think it's very important to say that even if you're not a fan of the Backstreet Boys, it's an excellent documentary, and it's not a puff piece. It's not some kind of promotional EPK. It really, it does talk about their last album, but if you actually want to see the ups and downs of a band, it's really intense and actually Mm -hmm. quite resonant, so definitely recommend it even if you're not a fan of pop music or even their music right. you become a fan of them as a group and, so. and that's just it and that's exactly what steven kajak the director and i and one would not think steven has directed incredible documentary music documentaries most notably on the rolling stones you would not think somebody directing music docs on the rolling stones is going to direct a doc about the backstreet boys but we will hear shortly about that um, but he, like me, was not a fan. Oh. And both of us, through his process of making the doc, he has become a fan of them, as I have. I mean, I have a lot of respect for these guys, um, that they've gone you know, through the abyss, come out the other side, and they're better for it. And I think that as hard as they may try to keep the same sound they had 20 years ago, I think their vocal changes have only served to make them better. Oh, totally. Totally. Um, there's a lot of vocal changes that go on in the documentary. I don't know if I want to spoil it. As, <laughs> let's not yeah, spoil let's not, it. I'm not going to spoil that part. But. but let's hear what the Backstreet Boys themselves had to say when I asked them about what makes them and this documentary relevant today. Well, the, the story wouldn't be there if we made it 20 years ago. Um, I don't know if that really answers your question, but at the same time, you have to live and learn. You have to grow. You have to become... You know, unfortunately, but fortunately, we've become from little little boys to men now in the business and the world that we live in with social media and everything has changed in the past five, six, ten years. Um, but again, like we wouldn't be the people that we are today if it weren't for all of the crap and the great times and the, the emotion that you see the roller coaster that we've been on for the past 20 years. And I don't think we would change any of it if you asked us. You know, it's part of our history. It's part of our livelihoods. It's part of us as individuals and as a group. So hopefully it keeps getting better. It's also a part of those fans' lives as well. You know, we share that together. So I think that's what's relevant, you know, is that we all share the common thing and they're seeing their lives. They've seen our lives from a surface level in a lot of ways on... TV, music videos, whatever you want to call it. Now they get a chance to really see, you know, behind the scenes and all those years, you know, sort of packed into one film. I mean, it gives you an actual story to tell. You're telling a 20-year career as opposed to some of these younger bands who are barely 20 themselves. So for a filmmaker, it was, it was a bonanza. It was great. We wanted to be honest. We wanted to be uh, uncensored. Uh, at the same time, you know, when we're telling these stories and, you know, there's a lot of things that didn't make the film, uh, and that was a hard part. I think the first edit was over three hours long. 
and you know 20 <laughs> plus years of stories to tell and then five different versions of that story and then weaving it all together without leaving out important moments or leaving and so different moments are important to each one of us so Stephen had quite a job to kind of get it all into a format that you could watch in one sitting and still make it compelling and interesting and compelling and interesting I think Kevin hit the nail on the head when he talked about that because it truly is can you imagine the challenge of actually editing a three-hour, I guess, initial cut oh. of the documentary? Well, it must and, be challenging. And we will be getting into that shortly because yeah. that's something that Stephen and I talked about at great length, the editing challenges. Because it's not just the shooting where they take cameras and they go to everybody's hometown to get some backstory on the boys that not even they knew about each other. They looked really surprised when they visited each other's hometowns. That was, yeah. I found that to be extremely amazing and very telling when you saw their reactions to one another at oh. learning more about their background, especially yeah. AJ taking ballet. What about Kevin and his bond with his family going back home to Kentucky, Kentucky I believe? Yeah. Yeah. And Nick also going back to Tampa and is revisiting his elementary school. Mm -hmm. Really emotional stuff and really real stuff too it didn't look really staged no. whatsoever that was so. and that i think is one of the things that as a director that steven and his cameraman uh james henry i think that's what they're really good at mm. is the those unscripted moments they catch them as they're happening they catch the reality and the humanity of them and so but i had to ask steven you know as a director and not a fan of the backstreet boys what made you want to do a documentary about them? <laughs> um, well, I mean, the origin story is is such that when the production company called me the first time, uh, and this is Pulse Films we're talking about, and these guys did films about LCD sound system, they were making a film about Nick Cave, they worked with Bjork, Blur, I mean, they're cool. So they call me, and, you know, having been ad admirers of my Scott Walker movie, and, and say, Backstreet Boys? I was like, you got to be kidding, right? <laughs> like, Nick Cave, Bjork, Backstreet Boys? You call me for Backstreet Boys? I don't think so. I actually turned it down. Because at the time, I had that hipster chip on my shoulder. I'm too cool for the Backstreet Boys. Um, and then Mia Bays, my producer, joined the team at Pulse and decided to, to helm Backstreet as a project. And she called me. I was like, don't be an idiot. Like, this is actually going to be a great story. And um, it was a little tail between my legs. I kind of felt like a bit of a jerk for being such a snob. And you really, when you... And I wasn't around for London. Like, they started just filming in London just to see if there was a story there. Um, uh. That's Mia, our producer. Um, and, you know, we had made a film together. And uh, and in a way, it started because then the editor that cut my Stones film was hired. So it was like getting the gang back together. Like, creatively, I said, I could make a film about anybody with this team. How much fun is this going to be? And then you meet the guys. And within, like, a, you know, 20 minutes on the phone, I was just going, these guys have so much personality, there's so much story here, and they're so willing to tell their story. Um, I guess the fear initially was that it would be just kind of a, a, a controlled puff piece, that they just wanted some, you know, boy band propaganda and thank you very much. But it couldn't have been more opposite. They wanted to be open, they wanted to be unedited and unscripted, and... Uh, their, their reference points were, you know, the Tribe Called Quest film or some kind of monster. I mean, they were thinking, like, cinematically. Like, mm -hmm. the, this is the kind of film we want for ourselves. Mm -hmm. So I said, that's an opportunity. And I think they all took advantage of that opportunity. That's a great reference, by the way. This movie really reminded me of Metallica's Some Kind of Monster. Mm -hmm. How unfiltered it was and how uh, it just, it really wasn't a sugary look at a former awesome boy band and, and how they're grown up. It's actually a real look at people and and their loss and their tragedies along mm -hmm. the years. It's and their triumphs as well. It's it's fantastic stuff. And it's yeah. also similar to what we saw from Sasha Gervais and his mm -hmm. the story of Anvil. Yeah. Oh, the story of Anvil. <laughs> there again, yeah. totally uncensored, yeah. honest, pure. Out of the blue hit too. It, absolutely nobody yeah. expected mm -hmm. that. Yeah. No, and then of course it sends Sasha on to direct Hitchcock. Right, right. Uh, yes, yes. So, yeah. 
Well, you know, before we get back to hearing more from Stephen Kajak, we're going to take a short break, and we'll be right back with Behind the Lens and more on the Backstreet Boys. Behind the Lens is sponsored in part by the Culver City Observer. Located in the heart of Screenland, Culver City Observer is available in print and online at www.culvercityobserver.com. And we are back behind the lens. I'm Debbie Lynn Elias, and this is Greg Srisavasti. I finally know how to pronounce my last name. So that's so, a good. I'm that's so a very glad. good thing. Yeah, yeah. And you can follow. You can follow Greg on Twitter at Deepest Streaming. Yeah, Deepest Streaming. Or deep, and yeah. then your website is deepestream.com. Thank you. Thank and you mention so much. your and mention this great giveaway again. Okay, the great giveaway. Just because I think it's this amazingly is so cool. great <laughs> is I'm giving away three Blu-rays for John Wick. So just go to my site, deepestream.com to check all the details thank you for that by the way ah my pleasure but thank you backstreet boys for that great documentary oh gosh yeah you know what's amazing is regarding your interview with steven i'm assuming by not being a huge fan and he was talking about being kind of a hipster having a hipster attitude towards the backstreet boys is when it came to the editing process he must have been very easily judicious and not very uh he must have really cut it with a very even eye and that's one of the things that i specifically talked to him about about being precious with footage and right. and whatnot because you've got so many voices and as we heard when we were together with the boys right. they like talking on e- over each other's voices right so you can just imagine when you've got wives when you have kids when you have family members everybody wants to see this that or the other and you're not kids anymore and you're not kids anymore but you're all behaving like them <laughs> in a good way. In a good way. In a good way. In a good way. Yeah. But, you know, one of the catalysts for this entire process of this documentary was Kevin Richardson returning. And I mm. asked Stephen about that. Had Kevin not left the group, stayed away, and then come back, would this have ever taken place? And here's what he had to say. Hmm. Oh, yeah. No, it was, a big, it was a big catalyst. And it just all the elements... All the kind of storytelling elements were really in place. If it was a film about the Backstreet Boys as a four-piece, just kind of making a new album, you'd kind of think, hmm, I'm not sure about this. But because there was like a reunion aspect to it, so that's interesting as a starting point. Because it's like, there's, a, there's an unknown quality. Like, is this going to work again? Um, it's, it is retrospective. It's a 20-year look back. But the fact that they wanted to push... F- It's like they wanted to push forward into their past together Mm -hmm. was, as a storytelling device, really exciting. Um, Because I had done films where I just sat 70 people down and did interviews and then cut it together with archival footage. And that gets really boring after a while. To just get in a little van and ride around with them at their hometowns and get to know them that way, that made the film really feel like it was coming to life. And I I think coming to life is, is a good way to put it. And the fact that there is minimal archival footage. Oh, it's all kind of here and now with them. And can you imagine Kevin just leaving a band for about, what, five, six years? I think it was like, yeah. Maybe even more, right? Yeah. And they did two studio albums without him. And to just jump off that train, I don't want to call it a gravy train, but it was a really solid career. Mm -hmm. And just to take a little time off for he and his family. And during the Kentucky segment where where he goes back home and he talks about the last days of his father and his family, and Mm -hmm. you just... And you just see him, what he's going through internally, because he seems like a very introspective person. It really hits home. It it, it does, yeah. and I and I think the whole, all all everything that happened with Lou Pearlman, their one time manager, founder, yeah. creator, the Ponzi scheme, the prison right. sentence, it's that takes its toll. Especially, it it takes a toll on somebody my age. It would definitely take a, a greater toll on a much younger person, and you can see that with the boys. Some of them still have problems well nick carter going back to the footage when he in elementary school when he's singing that i think it was, it's a phantom of the opera tune yeah and you just see him realizing saying that was one of his most amazing moments in his life and you can you, al- you always think when someone's rich or successful that everything's going to be gravy but it, it, it wasn't and it isn't and no. you just see it how it affects people and it's uh it's, it, it's a really amazing documentary so the humanity that it touches oh yeah when you're watching it, and then what it taps into with each of the boys. 
is right. really it, it's heartwarming to see and it's something we don't see enough of right and when you see them perform towards the end of the documentary it really puts their performances and their music into context mm -hmm. which is fantastic so. And what's interesting is, as Stephen told me, they were never going to include any of the new concert. That is weird. And, yeah. But as things were developing, as Stephen called it, he said, this was the cherry on top. We had to include it, as they saw in editing how this was playing out. Their dynamic, right? And yeah. the journey, the, it, they knew they had to include part of this concert footage. Mm. And... You know, as Stephen, he could, he can't give enough praise to his editors, Ben Stark and Cinzia Baldessari. They are amazing. And so I talked to him about how you mm. take all of this footage, how you take everybody's handhelds, all the footage of following them around. Because they only used two cameras while they were shooting. For the concert, they actually used six cameras and mm. then picked up some of the concert footage. But not a full concert package. So it's interesting to see the differences in there. But when it came to the editing, you know, how do you take all of this stuff and distill it down into a workable hour and 45 minutes? And here's what he said. And you just have to find your themes, uh, figure out the stories you do want to tell. I mean, it, you know, you start cutting it long. I mean, I, I just start by running everything chronologically, going, what happened on day one, what happened on day nine? And you just line it all up, and things emerge, you know? It's themes emerge, and then chronological arcs emerge, you know? Each hometown had its own little shape. And maybe they each had three chapters, and you had to figure out, hmm, I think we can only give them each one. Or maybe there's a couple that we can split them up. Part of Nick's hometown ends up kind of being a bit about AJ. You know, so figuring out how to balance it like that was was tough. Because you've got five individual stories. You've got the story of a band that's going into the past and into the future. <laughs> but that's brilliant because it's not like yeah. you have one boring thing that's like, and then, and then, and then. We could go back and forth in time. And it's finding those portals and those connections and the surprising shifts in chronology and space. That's just what makes an edit exciting. And luckily, they're each so interesting that we had a surplus of great stuff. Mm -hmm. We must have recut the film three or four times. Like we broke it and then rebuilt it. And then broke it again and went, okay, let's go. Now let's go a different way until you really felt like you got it right. I mean, there's so much. I mean, editing is, is pain because mm -hmm. you're, you're just leaving yeah. things. You're constantly having to kill your babies. You know what yeah. I mean? Because there's so many wonderful things. So, yes, yeah, so we are constantly killing our babies with editing. Not good to kill your babies when you're editing, I guess, right? Well, but that's where, that's where it becomes very important that, that things are not so precious. Right, right. I kind of want that long three-hour cut, though, for the uh, Blu-ray release. Well, guess, guess what's going to be floating around out there? What, just extra footage, you think, probably? All the extras. Oh, all the extras. All oh, okay. the extras. Yeah. And apparently some of the extras are already out floating around in Europe now and wow. uh, for fans. And uh, I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, we're going to have some of them popping up uh, in uh, via iTunes. On VOD and iTunes. On VOD oh, and okay, iTunes. Cool. And then there will be all of this extra stuff. But sadly... We will not have an alligator. No, no alligators. No alligator. No rabbits. No rabbits. <laughs> no alligator. There's a great Howie D story regarding rabbits. I'm not going to spoil it for you guys, but when you check it out, you know, it's going to be amazing. <laughs> okay. The only story that I wasn't enamored with was AJ commenting on his toenails. Oh, gotcha. <laughs> that, you know, okay. AJ, that was a little too much information. That was on a need to know basis. But... You know, we, we can live with that. So, going back to this editing process, with all of this footage, you know, how many hours, how many months did they spend um, going back and forth and going back and forth? Collecting everybody's notes and then just sitting there and just going through each one with my editor, sometimes with Mia, and just going, I agree, I agree, I don't agree, I don't agree, now eh, we can work on that. And you just you just have to let your gut kind of guide you. You want to take on as much of you know of their stuff as you can. But sometimes I mean clearly they don't have perspective on themselves because it's it's very intimate and personal. Right. So luckily that, that I think the benefit of having a non-fan helming this thing was really important. 
because mm-hmm. I wanted to make something that was interesting to me, and I wanted to bring those non-fans along on that journey with me as well, and find a way through this that would allow us, you know, to create a good deal of empathy mm-hmm. and interest in these guys. And of course, as we briefly mentioned earlier, you know, does it help him in his work as a director in making those hard choices? So yeah, like we we weren't precious about anything. I mean, we just we just wanted to go in there and make the best film we could that was as honest as we could. But again, I I, I have to give my editors a massive amount of credit because sometimes I'm I feel like like what am I doing? <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh-huh. You're just kind of orchestrating different elements, and you know I'm leaning on the creative skills of these amazing people. Mm-hmm. You know, it's the editors are the unsung heroes. I mean, they really it, the films are made in the editing room. Right. Here's the thing. Uh, I'd like to ask your opinion on this, but when people say films are made in the editing editing mm-hmm. room, do you think that's definitely a, a truism, or do you think a film, you know, like Hitchcock, he already has the film shot, shot by shot in his head already? Okay. Right? The film. Okay. When you're talking Hitchcock, the film is made in Alma's eyes. Very true. <laughs> Going back to that film Hitchcock and history. The film yes. is made in Alva Ravel's eyes. <laughs> Who sh- oh, no, I'm kidding. Yeah, of course, of course. For those that don't know, yeah. that that was Alfred Hitchcock's wife and indispensable. Speaking I, of unsung heroes. I, I, and I think Alma definitely, you know, she was the right hand and the left hand. Right. When it came to Hitchcock. But when filmmakers say that the film was made in the editing room, do you... Do you completely agree with that? Like most films are ma- are finally are found in the editing room, or are there a lot of filmmakers who actually know what they're going to shoot, and it, from um, from first cut to, to final cut, it's completely their vision. I think Gus Van Sant is a perfect example of their vision, from start to finish. Right. I think Terrence Malick, right, from start to finish. My favorite Brian De Palma is like that as well. Yeah, you know, I think for many people, and I talked at length with Wyatt Smith about this the other week um, Mm. when I interviewed him for Into the Woods, but we Mm, talked about mm, some other things as well. And the editor truly can just, you know, what you have on, you know, what you're shooting, the editor then can shift that and shape it into whatever story. You can shoot something straight through with a shot list, but then come right back Mm. and cut it apart. Mm. And... We have, not yet, not yet. Oh, we're waiting. We're waiting. waiting. We are waiting. Our connection is being completed with Edward James Olmos. So we're going to chat and buy some time here, and we'll finish up with the Backstreet Boys later in the program. Nice, nice. But while we're waiting for Edward to get on the phone, let us mention our visual aid today. Ephraim Katz's The Film Encyclopedia. The Film Encyclopedia. It it's is a must-have, right? For for any cinephile, for anybody that likes film, you really must have it. And I'm looking. I'm looking. I'm looking in the booth. And we are ready to go to talk with Edward James Almos. Hello, Edward. Hello. How are you, Debbie? I am fine. I am so thrilled. Oh to talk to you about this documentary. I'm thrilled to talk to you no matter <laughs> what. It's been a long time since we last saw each other. Um, I think it was at uh, one of the uh, Latino International Film Festivals. Oh, fantastic. But, um, Edward, this documentary is amazing. Absolutely amazing. Everybody knows you, f- you know, not only for your, uh, for your indelible roles and your iconic characters, but also for your activism. And now getting into the planet, this is a new, a new kind of activism for you, is it not? Well, in many forms, uh, in using, say, uh, saying, have you seen my other documentaries that I've done on the water and uh, solar power and stuff like that, I, unless you've seen my growth throughout the last 45 to 50 years, you wouldn't know whether or not uh, you know what I've done. <laughs> so, you know this is this is uh, this is a long time coming, and it's been, uh, it's been very very much uh, an ongoing process. And uh, it it seemed uh, obvious to me that uh, uh, we had an incredible world here when I was very young. I'm sorry, I'm hearing a feedback. Can you hear it? Oh, we can hear it a little bit, but we can still hear you. Okay, good. 
Uh, but and basically, what what would, what I did when I was small was I used to be with my great grandfather who helped raise me, and we had like a little piece of land. It must have been maybe ten feet by thirty feet, and on it we would grow you know, tomatoes. It would be chili. It would be uh, cucumber. It would be lettuce. Uh, you know, little things. And then we had an avocado tree on our property, and we were right in the middle of uh, East LA, and. Uh, and then uh, to uh, sup, sup, uh, supplement our, our income, we would go during the summers and to picking with the migrant workers. We'd go out and pick fruit, and uh, the whole family would go, so we'd go out there. And it was a lot of you know a lot of hard work, but it was also really kind of a, a communal feeling. It was a very very strong communal feeling because there was a lot of kids out in the fields, and you know we're all picking you know oranges and and fruit. And so uh, my love for for understanding uh, the the environment came at a very since I was born. Mm-hmm. My great grandfather was uh, uh, indigenous to this uh, hemisphere. He was uh, pure blood uh, on my mother's side, and uh, amazingly uh, strong. Uh, he was from Zacatecas, mm-hmm. and he was an indigenous person, Indian from there, and. Uh, and so we had a really strong understanding of the earth. And he, he, at the age of three, four, five years old, he used to tell me, you know, our biggest, our biggest, uh, the thing we have to nourish the most and we really have to be careful of is the water. In the future, and, you know, a hundred years from today, the water will be the most important aspect of living. This was in 1947. Mm-hmm. I mean, excuse me, 50, 49, 50, 51. And uh, sure enough, here we are 60-something years later, and the most important aspect of life right here, especially <laughs> in California right now, is water. Right. And uh, so I've been a, involved with Waterkeeper for at least know, 15 years. Mm-hmm. And uh, I got involved with, uh, uh, right now, on, on <laughs> Energizing the World, this program that we're doing right now. Uh, and it, it is so advanced, and it's beautifully done. Mm-hmm. They go all over the world, and they see how energy can help uh, the planet and wh- where we need the energy, and what kind of energy do we need. And, of course, the solar and uh, the wind and uh, you know, has been the, the biggest asset in many, many aspects of bringing uh, electricity and power to different parts of the world so that they could you know, uh, extend themselves and, and grow stronger. So uh, I've been around it for a long time. To be honest with you, Demi, it's but, you like know, an integral part of my life. There's no difference. I, like this morning, I went up. I climb every morning in the morning, and I go up a, into Caballero Canyon and I climb up the side of mountains. I do it every day, and it's a really good exercise. A little bit better than the, uh, the walking machine, gym. Uh, it's a lot more radical action for cardiovascular, but it's really, really wonderful. Like I climb for about four miles, and I come back an hour and a half, two hours later, and and I go on for the rest of my day. But when I'm up there going up the trail, I take a bag with me, and uh, I always pick up any trash that I find. Mm. And uh, so I'm the trail keeper as well as a water keeper. Oh. And when I go to the beach, I, I'll take a bag with me, and I'll walk along the beach, and I'll pick up trash. Now, my grandchildren do it. You know, my children do it. I do it. And it's an integral part of just the behavior that we do when we go out someplace. We just kind of if we find something on the ground, we pick it up. Now, if everybody did that, it would be a different planet. Now, of course, you can't tell anybody anything. You really can't. You have to lead by behavior and uh, example. So, you know, I just, you know, like today, you're asking me this question, and so I'm saying it, and maybe somebody will hear it and say, oh, you know, it sounds like something, I, you know, that's that's what I do. Or I, I should try that. And, you know, it's a lot of, it really changes the whole perspective of your life as soon as you start to do that kind of behavior. Well, and that, to me, is the best thing that you can do for yourself. What, like you'll live, live a lot longer. Just very and curious. It really, it's, it's like almost like a, uh, uh, a Zen uh, spiritual <laughs> situation that happens when you start to go around cleaning up and, and, and helping and, and uh, you see something that's, you know, somebody throws a piece of paper or 
a can or a bottle or something on the ground. You pick it up, and, you know, you take it over and you put it away, you dispose of it. And uh, by doing that, inside of yourself, it's a great sense of understanding that may, empowers you. It gives you a sense of good feeling. And, and, you know, if there's a cancer inside of you or something's going on, the energy that you get, well, because of the, uh, the way that your body is feeling and your mind is working, uh, it helps defeat the cancers in your body. The, the, anything that's going on inside your body is healed by good, like laughter. It's healed by uh, good feelings, uh, a sharing with others. Uh, all those things empower your body to, to really become all that they can be. Plus, uh, I, I love, I found two years ago, I found something that just, I'm so grateful that somebody shared it with me, and I, I share it with everybody that I talk to. It's called Moringa. It's the Moringa, M-O-R-I-N-G-A. Like mm-hmm. Mo, mm-hmm. rings, and then with A at the end. Moringa. It sounds like a dance. It does. And what it is, it's, 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 a, it's a tree. And the, the, the leaf of the tree is so nutriated. It's got so much powerful nutrients, more than any other food that we have on the planet comes from that tree. And I didn't know about it. I didn't know about it until two years ago. And I take it every day, seven days a week. I take it. I eat, I eat every single day. I eat this. It's better than any vitamin, any kind of uh, superfood that, that humans have made. Anybody that makes something human uh, uh can I get close to this? Uh, it's the most nutritional food I've ever tasted. And if anybody's listening to us right now, they should definitely check it out. Go online and watch Discovery Channel's uh, a documentary. There's a 16-minute documentary on it. It's very, very, very powerful. And you will just be so grateful that you saw it from Moringa. So I've been with Moringa, with, <laughs> with uh, fail keeping, with water keeping, with, uh, you know, water keepers, with uh, this uh, energizing the planet, uh, you know, I feel great. Yeah, I feel great. Mr. Almost, in almost a, 70. Mr. Almost, in a way, uh, regarding energizing our world, do you feel that you, with your your passion for the environment and, and sustainability, do you feel yourself over the years just connect? It's a great way to actually connect to people and to, to connect to the world and to connect to humanity, to see everything on not just a personal level, but on a, on a wide-scale, universal level as well. Yes, of course. I mean, basically what you're doing is you're, you're, you're giving towards a common good, and uh, it enhances everything. It's like going around and picking up a piece of paper that's on the ground that somebody threw, and it's just littering. And, and the person who threw it has no idea what they've done, right. or maybe they do. But the person picking it up is the one who gets beneficial understanding of it to the total and saying, wow, this is really not good. I think I'll pick this up with a trash can. There you go. What is it? uh, Go ahead. I was going to ask you, Edward, what is it about uh, that you found the most interesting or informative about the documentary? Um, I was, because I'm aware of the uh, self-sustainability, I'm aware of water keepers and some of the other things that are going on in the world, but the detail that the documentary gets into, talking about sustainable architecture, the smart, yep. the smart grid electricity that Malaga, Spain, is doing, they see exactly. it's like they're so far ahead of the United States. It seems. And, and, well, they're not, but they are. I mean, there's more awareness of it, and they're doing more of it. We're aware, very aware of everything. We we actually have it here in this mm-hmm. country, and but we haven't been able to really get the people to really move towards it because of there's a lot you gotta remember uh, i i asked myself going back to, to the moringa mm-hmm. i asked myself why isn't this tree planted in our country why aren't we using the, the the natural perspectives of what this gives to us human beings with over 90 nutrients and vitamins and amino acids and, and it just got so much uh positiveness your body. Why is it all over? Then a person said to me, he said, you know, Eddie, if people really find out about this, they'll just take Moringa and they won't take anything else. <laughs> so all these health food stores that sell Moringa will only be selling Moringa and all the other products won't be sold. And and I said, well, what does that mean? That means that, that people shouldn't know that this stuff is like the best way to get your nutrients on the planet. 
much better than any vitamin. You know, if you see the content of, of, of a moringa leaf when it gram for gram against, uh, you know, all the other foods that are on the planet, you're going to realize, you say, holy heck, this stuff is just unbelievable. And no human being has made it. It's, they grew it. But that's what it is. It's economical base. Mm-hmm. Economically speaking, the fossil fuel companies have a very difficult time trying to motivate people to use solar and wind power. And so, you know, what are we talking about? We're talking about economics and, and you know, what drives us if it isn't economics. So uh, our country is it doesn't have Moringa because it would put a lot of different people in the pharmaceutical business out of business. And so people have to realize that you're fighting a a uh, double-edged sword here, you know. What you're, you're damned if you do, and you're damned if you don't. And uh, so, for me, I just want people to understand themselves to the fullest. So, what do I do? I make like this <laughs> documentary. I talk to my friends about moringa. I walk along the, the paths of, of my uh, hiking, and I pick up junk and dirt and stuff. That, I mean, uh, stuff to stone all over the, the ground, and I, if I go to the beach, I do the same thing. I pick up stuff when I'm walking. And look, I'm not going to clean everything up because I'm only one person. Right. But I can do a pretty good job of, of getting rid of some stuff while I'm out walking along the beach and I see something on the ground. It, it takes nothing to have a bag with absolutely nothing. Mm-hmm. You know, people say, I'm not a junk collector. I'm not you know, a trash collector. I'm not, you know, I'm not going to go around cleaning up other people's... Uh, messes and that's exactly the attitude i mean that really we we live with so i don't personally but other people do yeah and i and i love that you talk about this because when i was growing up in suburban philly and down at the jersey shore my grandparents uh were had come over from germany in the early part of the 20th century and it was so important to them whenever we would be out walking around freshwater lakes or in the woods Always, if you see trash, you pick it up. And from small on, that was ingrained in me that that's what you do. That's right. And that's what we did, too. I mean, it was taught to me. It's taught behavior. It's not, you know, like you come out of your mother's womb and, and you, go, you you know, you start to grow and all of a sudden you're going around saying, oh, this is wrong. You should pick it up. No. Somebody did it and you saw it. Somebody in your family did it and you saw it. And the behavior's been passed on. And that's why I do what I do. If I can do well, it. And you do it. Great. We are all the better for all the things that you do, Edward. I can tell you that much. I mean, from your Latino literacy programs to Latino public broadcasting, the film festivals, uh, making us all aware of our world. When do you get time to, to rest? Or do you? Well, climbing up the mountain in the morning after waking up I wake up in the morning, I'm so grateful just for waking up. Just I wake up in the morning and go, oh, I can do this again. Yes. Because <laughs> you know, there's going to be one day when I'm not going to do it. I won't wake up or I won't go to sleep, one of the two. Or I'll go to sleep forever. But uh, basically, I'm very grateful when I wake up. And as soon as I wake up, as soon as I wake up, I go in and I, and I, I take my Moringa. And, and I drink a lot of water, and I take my Moringa, and I climb them out. That's it. That's my daily at, you know, 6 o'clock in the morning, five five thirty or 6, I wake up, and, and I'm out on the, uh, on the trail by 6.30. And I'm done with that by 8, 8.30. So and then you... the rest of the day is mine. Wow. Do whatever else I want to do. Now, I know that you have to go uh, in a moment here, but I wanted to ask you, the world premiere of Energizing Our World was last night at Santa Barbara Film Festival. How was that received last night? I haven't heard from anybody. I haven't, I haven't heard the results yet because I oh. wasn't there, but i got to tell you, the people that get to see it on the big screen are really lucky. Uh, I have to go. <laughs> I have to go see. I saw it on a small screen. Uh, but yeah, it is, and it was very powerful. It is yeah. Powerful. It is so beautiful, and I think Susan Sember by shooting with the Me so- too. with the Sony 4K to really show the beauty of the world that we're we're just destroying if we don't do something. I, you I, know, I'm 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 an optimist, and but I'm pragmatic. Hmm. So I got my feet on the ground, and I'm really understanding of the positiveness 
importance of what we're doing with our lives, but knowing full well that we're overpopulated. There's a more, you know, close to 8 billion people on the planet, and mm-hmm. by within another 10 years, we'll probably be 10 billion. Mm-hmm. And uh, we're continue our footprint is getting stronger and stronger and, and more. So we have to enhance the usage of natural uh, energizing power. And uh, once you see this movie, you start to say to yourself, oh, yeah, I know all this. No, nothing in this movie is new. Right. It's just, it's used in ways that we've not, never seen it used before. Mm-hmm. And we're grateful that they're using it that way because people that are using it are really getting a lot of benefit. And if we can learn how to use our surrounding area uh, in a positive way, our natural resource power, we will be in much better shape. And we've got to start with the water. Mm-hmm. We have to start capturing water better. You know, we have to learn how to, how to recycle water. Well, I think, I think every, whenever anybody sees this documentary, Energizing Our World, I think they're going to walk out and they're going to say, it is time for me to, if you'll pardon the expression, to stand and deliver on our planet. Well, God willing, people will be able to see it. You know what I mean? And uh, people will take the time, 56 minutes, to yeah. watch what happens around the world. And uh, it's, I love it. I, mean, I thought it was an original perspective because very few people get the opportunity to go around the world and to see how people are using energy and the needs and the new things that are being done mm-hmm. and the, the reasons why. So uh, I, I'm very grateful. So thank you guys for your interest. Thank you. Edward, thank you so much. This has been an absolute pleasure. Bless your heart. I'll talk to you soon. Yes. Bye-bye. Yeah. And Edward James Almost energizing our world. I lack energy, but he gave me a little bit of energy, a little infusion there. I'll tell you, we need to go get that Moringa. Moringa, yes. And we're going to take a quick break, and we'll be back. Behind the Lens is sponsored in part by the Culver City Observer. Located in the heart of Screenland, Culver City Observer is available in print and online at www.culvercityobserver.com. And we are back behind the lens. And in case you're just joining us, you just missed a great conversation with Edward James Olmos. Very good interview. Talking about new documentary from Susan Sember, um, Energizing Our World. One of the glaring statistics, I had no idea, 1.4 billion people in the world, they don't have access to electricity. That, I, yeah, that amazing. I found I knew that the numbers were large. I had no clue it was that large. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, you know, listen, it, it, I want to find out more about Moringa now. If yeah, this, definitely. If, 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 if this is what's giving Edward all of his uh, energy every day. I've never even climbed a mountain. And the fact that he's almost 70 and he's climbing a mountain every single morning for a couple of hours, wakes up at, what, 5 or 5.30 just to go to his local... S- 6.30, he's on the trail. Oh, wow. By 8.30, he's done. Yeah. But we I wouldn't survive a mountain. Uh, well, could you do it? Could you do the hike? Are you crazy? Okay, all right. Please. It'd be nice. It'd be, it'd be kind of cool. Uh, it would be kind of cool. I don't think the knees and, and the ankle would, would withstand it, but I'm always game to try. Right, okay. As long as there are no cliffs that anybody can push me off of. You so know. that's not on your bucket list. That's not on the climbing every mountain is not on your No, bucket climbing list. every mountain. I will no. leave that to Julie Andrews and, and Christopher <laughs> okay. Plummer. Okay. Which of course they will be doing at the TCM Film Festival next month. Oh, okay. Wow. The Sound of Music opens the yeah. TCM Festival okay. and they will it's confirmed they will be there opening night. Not bad. Yeah. So see that scene. You're not too crazy about that TCM film fest, are you? No, no I I no. am no. 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 You just I, love it so much though. I sure. truly, truly do. Yeah. And because it preserves our history, it promotes our history with film. Um and if we don't understand or know where we came from, there's no way you're gonna know where we are now or where we're going. Just as Edward was talking about with the planet itself. Right. Okay, very quickly about the TCM Film Fest. It, last year was the first time I covered it. Mm-hmm. It's so it, it's so amazing just to see how many people line up around the block on Hollywood Boulevard. I, I saw a screening of How Green Was My Valley, that mm-hmm. great John Ford film. It was so hard to get tickets to that. Yeah. 
yeah, just moviegoers from around the um, world. So. You were there for that screening? Yeah. I, I was the coffer. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, yes, no, I was the coffer that Maureen O'Hara called, at, called me out oh, on. Oh, nice. And made nice. me stand up so God could bless me. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, that'll go on my tombstone. But both those, you know, Energizing Our World is such an excellent documentary about making a difference. Like Edward was saying, just picking up trash, uh, just energizing your neighborhood with all the small decisions you make as a consumer and as an inhabitant of this planet. So Yeah, I mean, I, I'll walk around my condo complex, and if there's trash, I will pick it up, and I will take it and put it in a dumpster. Mm. Okay, you know, I'm finally getting t- rid of two old cars that should be in a dumpster, but, you know, so... <laughs> slowly but surely. Slowly but surely. Yeah. Every little bit helps. But this, the documentary, when it talks about the sustainability through ag parks, sustainable agriculture, energy, electricity, mentioned the smart grids in Malaga, Spain, the new yeah. technologies uh, that are shown through a dye company in Amsterdam, how they can now dye fabric without water and without toxins... This is all, and to have it all cohesively put together in this one documentary. And taking advantage of a tropical climate to actually create a sustainable building yeah. without using too much electricity. It's amazing. Yeah, Good I mean, stuff. I can't recommend it highly enough. Anybody that has a chance to see it, see it. Any film festival that is contemplating showing it, do it. Um, and also, like you were saying, shot on 4K, it's not just a talking head documentary. No. It's a beautiful documentary to actually for the eyes as well very much so and mm-hmm. shows us the beauty that uh, we need to preserve mm-hmm. so and speaking of beauty for many <laughs> of the ladies out there you know we'll go back to talking about the beautiful men man crush monday man crush monday so, great one right. man crush monday edward james Olmos and the backstreet mm-hmm. boys backstreet boys for brian um, but <laughs> who, by the way, can carry a tune. He actually was apologizing, but he actually he, he's not a bad singer. He I might we should actually have him sing a couple of notes every single segment. I, I think so. The intro, outro, Brian, maybe. You know, had we known this, we could he could have done the theme music for me instead of you know, Andrew. I can't say his last name, um, but yeah. just because I can't pronounce it. Uh, but we quickly have another. A final piece of my interview with Stephen Kajak about, did, or did we do this one? We nope. did, yeah, we did it. We last, did this one. We're on the last clip. Well, we're on the very last one. And the back, last, last clip. We're back to the boys themselves. Oh. You know, giving a wrap up of, and this is, I mean, it's a great observation by Kevin Richardson talking about what this documentary, what the Backstreet Boys, show them what you're made of is to him. It's this idea of the film started off as a making of let's record, let's film us with our phones, with our own handheld recorders, making this album, this 20th anniversary album, making this tour, let's film this. And then when our management took us to Mia and Pulse uh, Media out of the UK, and then we got Steven on board and we, we all sat down, we're like, we don't want this to be a VH1 behind the music. We already did that. We we don't want this to be a fluff promotional piece. We have a lot of stories to tell. We've, we've lived an extraordinary life. The five of us have worked as a team and made our dreams come true. And we just trusted and were honest and we let the cameras roll through the whole process and we trusted in Steven and Mia and that's what you have, so... And that is what we have. That is what we have. Very quickly, yes. if you really, just all the listeners here, if you really want to actually a great companion piece to Behind the Lens, just go to MovieSharkToBlur.com because Debbie writes really in-depth Aww. and really excellent reviews. They're not, they're not, you know, they're not showy for show's sake. They're actually really informative. And, um, you know, off the record, I, I, I copy, I copy, copy and paste all the reviews and I put it on my blog. Hope you didn't know oh, that. Just want to throw that, don't, so you know, that, legal that's matters. Where all, that's where all my one-on-one interviews <laughs> right. are going. Yeah, You're going yeah. To, Drive no. traffic, I just, you know, just it's, link. It's good to know. No, but in all seriousness, just go to her site. It's really great stuff on, on um, a real movie lover site. So I appreciate that. Thank you. I'd like to thank for all my years and all the money and all the work and all the aggravation in the industry. It pays off. That it pays off somewhere. Yeah. Now, I know next week you will not be here, but the following week we are in for a real treat for a pre-Oscar, pre-Spirit Awards. Right. There will be 
Four the, people here? The Terrible Trio will be here. Oh, okay. You, me, and Chad Miller will nice. be back. And then joining us, a real treat for us, is a good friend of ours, Josh Idikoff, third generation projectionist. Um, Charles Idikoff, many of you may know, runs the Idikoff Screening Room. And for decades, if you were an Academy voter, you saw your film at the Idikoff Screening Room. A fixture in Hollywood history. Very Definitely. much so. And Charles will be 100 years old the day of the Oscars. That's, I had no idea. Wow. So, Josh yeah. is going to be here and uh, maybe hear some Charles stories. Um, no, Charles, if you're listening, and I think you are, you are not allowed to come to Whittier. Um, <laughs> next week, I'm going to be here, maybe alone, but you're, we're going to hear from the director, Marjane uh, Satrapi. Uh, the Voices is her new film with Ryan Reynolds, Anna Kendrick, Jackie Weaver. Uh, she did Chicken with Plums and Persepolis. And live, we're going to have writer-director Jane Clark talking about one of the craziest anti-Valentine's Day movies, Crazy Bitches. Oh, I'm one, so I'm, I can't wait to see that. Oh, it's, it's <laughs> well worth it. So, that's it for today. You can catch us on, on Movie Shark to Blore. The audio will be up later today. We'll have the video pack out later this week. And we'll see you next week.